Hey everyone, it's Alexander Robinson. Welcome to the channel. And this is my spoiler review for Godzilla Minus One. Yes, over a month after the movie came out in the United States and over two since it came out in Japan, I'm finally talking about this movie. It topped my list for the best movies of 2023. And I know a lot of you have been asking me to go into spoilers when it comes to this movie because I'm a massive Godzilla fan. Well, considering that this is actually the 70th anniversary of the franchise, franchise, I think it's perfectly appropriate that I kick off the new year with talking about Godzilla once again. And this isn't so much like talking about plot twists or any secret things that the movie may have hidden. This is just more getting into the full details of why I really love this movie. Because there is so much to talk about with this movie that it really can't be emphasized why I love it in one video. But anyway, I love the opening of this movie. We get introduced to Koichi landing at a repair base on Odo Island. It was a repair base for kamikaze pilots, but Koichi actually lands there because he's trying to defy his orders. And this is something that touches upon a major theme in the film that I'll get to a little later. But anyway, they go over his plane, inspect it to full detail, but the head mechanic is a little suspicious on why his plane is in perfectly good shape. And then the day goes on, another mechanic approaches Koichi and tells him, I don't blame you for what you've done. Then nightfall comes around, the alarm goes off, and they all think that it's some sort of new American weapon, that they're gonna be attacked by the United States. But then they hear something far in the distance, and one of the mechanics in a search tower turns on the light, and then the camera pans over, and we see this giant dinosaur, and it's really a jump scare moment. The dinosaur attacks the lighthouse, kills the operator, and everybody's just wondering, what is that thing? To where one of the mechanics goes, it's Godzilla. Like, that's one of the things I love about Godzilla's introduction in this movie. We get to see him as a pre-mutated Godzillasaurus. They don't build up to him, they just do a jump scare and shine a spotlight on him. And the reason why he's named Godzilla in this incarnation is the same as in the original, where he's just considered to be this legend by the villagers of Odo Island. So, no real reason to go into, like, why is this called Godzilla? It's the same as the original. But anyway, this whole sequence is one giant tribute to Jurassic Park, in the sense that Godzillasaurus is three times the size of a regular T-Rex. It's got that suspenseful tension to it, like the first time we see the Rex in Jurassic Park. Koichi is ordered to get into his plane and use the guns to kill Godzillasaurus, but Koichi hesitates, and this leads to one of the mechanics firing his rifle at Godzillasaurus angering him, and then he just slaughters all the mechanics, destroys the plane, causing Koichi to black out until daylight, to where the head mechanic is gathering up all the bodies and blames Koichi for their deaths because he hesitated with firing the gun. So then we cut to Koichi heading back home to the mainland, where the head mechanic drops by and gives him a folder full of the photos of the mechanics' families. In a way to make Koichi guilty in the sense that this is what you did. Because you hesitated on shooting Godzillasaurus, all these men cannot go back to their families. And then when Koichi heads back to Tokyo, he sees that the entire place has been reduced to dust because of the fire bombings. Now when it comes to learning about World War II in the United States, we're always told about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And one event that we're never really told about that often in the U.S. were the Tokyo fire bombings, where the U.S. pretty much raided the entirety of Tokyo and reduced it to ash. In fact, if you watch a lot of the original Godzilla from Ashiro Honda, there are images that really reflect the Tokyo fire bombings as well. So when Koichi arrives to what was supposed to be his parents' home, it's destroyed, his parents are dead, and he's soon confronted by his neighbor, shunning him for being a coward, being a disgrace since he was a kamikaze pilot uh, who didn't die, uh, and blaming him for the death of her kids, saying that had you actually done your duty, my kids would still be alive. And then we cut to a couple months later where everyone's 
trying to get their life back on track. And this is where Koichi meets Noriko and Akiko, and they kind of move into his place because Noriko's parents are gone. Akiko's an orphan and Noriko pretty much brought her in, otherwise she would have died. And this is where we get to the point when the neighbor starts helping them out uh, as much as she hates Koichi at this point. Uh, they start forming their own individual family. Koichi ends up getting a job as a minesweeper where he's introduced to our other three characters in the movie, the captain, Doc, and Kid. That's their nicknames in the movie. And this point of the movie is just watching these characters bond, get their lives back on track, and just trying to move on after a horrifying event like World War II. And again, you really grow to like all these characters. In terms of Captain, Doc and Kid. Uh, they're all very distinctive from one another. I mentioned that Kid was the younger soldier, but he actually never served in the war. Right? But there were points where he did have a few wishes that, man, I wish the war had gone longer because I would have liked to serve in it, to where Koichi just goes, you better not mean that. Huh? So you're never bored throughout this whole sequence of these characters bonding and getting their lives back. But of course, Koichi is still haunted by the events of the Odo Island incident. And then we get a shot of the nuclear bomb testing at Operation Crossroads in the Bikini Toll. If you've seen the Roland Emmerich movie or the 2014 film, you know that they use this wide shot, this aerial view of an atomic bomb testing. That's Operation Crossroads, and in this incarnation of Godzilla, that's what mutates him into the Godzilla that we know and fear. And then we get a montage of the US military reporting a giant unidentified organism in the ocean. Godzilla attacks one of their own ships, but the US can't get involved with taking care of Godzilla because they don't want to stir any tensions between them and the Soviet Union. Keep in mind, after we won World War II, the Cold War started not too long where the Soviet Union were against us. So then we get to the big Jaws sequence of the movie, where our main characters are in their tiny little minesweeping boat made of wood and try to outrun Godzilla. I don't remember who said it, but somebody mentioned that some of the best homages to franchise films come from movies that are not part of its own franchise. For example, in Top Gun Maverick, the big action sequence in the canyon is the best homage to the Death Star Trench run in the original Star Wars. So in Godzilla Minus One, we get the best homage to Jaws. There's even a sequence where a mine is sent into Godzilla's mouth. Koichi shoots it and detonates it, just like the big finale in Jaws. But instead of killing Godzilla, it just blows off a chunk of his mouth to where he quickly regenerates. Every time I've seen this movie, when Godzilla starts regenerating so quickly, the entire audience is horrified at that moment. Like, a bomb just went inside his mouth, but he's able to heal like that. And then when the heavy cruiser Takao comes in and tries to engage Godzilla, you get the feeling that, oh, they got him. This thing is so powerful that it finally took out Godzilla. But no, we get an overhead view of the ship. We see the water glowing blue right underneath it. There's a beam of light that pierces through the ship and it blows up. Godzilla emerges from the ocean, roars in victory, and then takes off, leaving our characters to be stranded until they're rescued. And when I saw this movie for a third time, after Godzilla destroyed the heavy cruiser, there was a woman in my audience that let out a horrified, oh my god, because it's such a tense sequence between the Jaws homage to Godzilla attacking the ship. It is just an amazing sequence. And soon after that, when Koichi returns home, this is where we get one of two scenes that brings me to tears. When Koichi basically breaks down to Nariko how he survived an Odo Island incident. The screams of all the mechanics that died because he hesitated to kill Godzilla haunt him. He carries photos of their family. And there's a point where he was like, maybe I wasn't destined to live. Maybe I'm already dead and you're a fantasy. And this is where Noriko basically tells him, look, you survived the war. It doesn't matter if you disobeyed your order as a kamikaze pilot, you survived the war and those that survived the war were meant to live. It is a heart-wrenching scene that gets me every time I watch it, and it's amplified by Naoki Sato's excellent score. I mean, his score in this entire movie 
is excellent. It's never in your face. It complements each scene perfectly. And he makes good use of the Akira Ifukube track. But then Koichi wakes up the next day, sees Noriko and Akiko like serving breakfast. It's basically him waking up to a new day and realizing that had I actually died, I probably wouldn't have this life right here. I wouldn't have had these two people in my life. But of course, Godzilla just happens to make landfall in the Genzo district where Nariko is working. And this is where the iconic Godzilla theme starts playing as soon as he makes landfall. And it just gets me every time. The Godzilla theme when he shows up and Nariko goes, is that Godzilla? It just sends chills down my spine. And this whole sequence is one of the reasons why I like this movie more than I do Shin Godzilla, which again, I still think is great. But one of the big issues I had with Shin Godzilla on and off is that I never got a sense that the main characters were in any sort of danger because they're either far away from Godzilla's destruction, they're in a bunker somewhere where they can't be harmed. I just never feared for these characters' lives whenever Godzilla was causing mayhem and destruction. No, in this sequence, Nariko is in the middle of Godzilla's destruction. Koichi shows up and tries to rescue her, and this is where we get the haunting atomic breath sequence. Both Shin Godzilla and Minus One have done phenomenal jobs at basically reinventing Godzilla's atomic breath. Shin Godzilla was certainly more out there with the lasers coming out from his back, but it was still effective and haunting nonetheless. And this sequence, when the spines like kind of pop out and then push down just as Godzilla unleashes his atomic breath, that's creepy in itself, but the fact that the atomic breath actually leaves a giant nuclear explosion, it may be on the nose in Godzilla being a metaphor for atomic war, but it's still effective. Like that one blast just takes out the entirety of the district. And as Koichi and Nariko look on in horror, you get that slow motion shot where Nariko pushes Koichi out of the way. And the second you see that, you're like, no, because Nariko gets caught in the blast and you get that sense that she didn't make it. Like she gave Koichi this whole speech about you surviving the war, therefore you were meant to live. And she gives her life to save his. This is the other sequence in the movie. No matter how many times I've seen it, no matter the fact that I know how this movie ends, that sequence gets me. And once again, it's due to Naoki Sato's score. When Koichi looks up at Godzilla that's looking up at this giant mushroom cloud, it gets me every time. Just the visual imagery. Seeing Koichi's pain at losing a loved one to this monster, it's a great sequence. And the music that plays during the sequence on the soundtrack is called the Elegy. And it's right up there with Akira Ifukube's Requiem track from Godzilla vs. Destroya. It's just so haunting, so heartbreaking. And this leads into the big plan of the movie, where a bunch of Japanese citizens that have served in the war realize that we can't rely on the government for taking care of this. And we can't depend on the US either, because that'll stir up Soviet and US tension. So a bunch of these private citizens that have served in the war at some point band together and Doc ends up being the big mastermind to the big plan to stop Godzilla, which I think is pure genius. Like it may have its goofy elements, but in terms of all the big tactics used to stop Godzilla in the past, it's more logical, it's more well planned out, and it's more creative at the end of the day. Basically the whole plan is that Godzilla can't be killed by conventional weaponry, so we have to come up with another way to defeat him. And the plan is to basically wrap cables around Godzilla and sink him to the bottom of the ocean. They plan to sink him in Sagami Bay, which is a really deep part near Japan. And you might think, well, Godzilla is an aquatic creature. How's that going to work? Well, him sinking that fast, no creature, even if they live in the ocean, is going to contend with the pressure. Okay, but what if that doesn't kill Godzilla? Then we'll bring him up as quickly as we sunk him, and hopefully the decompression will kill him. And even though this plan is very well thought out, you can tell there's a lot of hesitation from people. There are some members who just don't want any part of it because like, look, 
I already served in the war, I have a family, I can't do this. To where a high ranking officer goes, look, this is not an order. We're not telling you to be part of this. Uh, you are free to leave if you want no part of it at all. Huh? So a handful of people end up leaving because they just don't want to be part of another war. But most of the room goes, this is ridiculous, but who else is going to do this if not us? Huh? And if this is a chance for us to fight for our future, then let's do this. Huh? And this leads into one of the film's big messages that Takashi Yamazaki is trying to convey. Huh? This movie is very much a jab at how Japan treated its soldiers during World War II. Huh? The whole idea of kamikaze pilots alone huh, is inhumane. Huh? And there's a big speech before the big climax of the film that Doc delivers where Japan has cared so little about our lives. Huh? Lack of food, lack of ejection seats in planes. Huh? Like, we were really sent out there in World War II to die, essentially. Huh? So this battle we're about to face, don't think of it as a fight to the death. Huh? Think of it as a fight to live huh? for our future. Huh? And again, going back to my knowledge of World War II, it's so fascinating to watch this perspective of World War II from Japan, huh? to hear a lot of the hardships that they had to go through huh? and how they were treated with so little respect. It is pretty eye-opening at the end of the day. Yes, it is a Godzilla movie, but considering that this franchise started with a heavy anti-war message, it makes perfect sense that this theme would come back again in a different and more well-thought-out form. So you can tell that everyone that's a part of this operation is happy to do it. They know they have something to fight for rather than going out there to fight to the death. And then we also get a backup plan where Koichi is flying a prototype plane out there to try to distract Godzilla and lure him to Sagami Bay, but they need a mechanic to fix the plane in order for it to not only function, but also carry a bomb that they can drive inside Godzilla's mouth should the big plan not work. So the lead mechanic from Odo Island comes in regrettably, well, after Koichi pissed him off with a letter saying that the lead mechanic was responsible for the Odo Island deaths. So he fixes the plane, but he also has a change of heart and hearing that Koichi has started a family of his own and that he's looking after a young girl. The lead mechanic basically tells Koichi, live. You have a young girl to look after. There's an ejection seat in the plane. As soon as you pull the lever to activate the bomb and fly into Godzilla's mouth, pull that other lever to eject yourself out to safety. It's a really touching moment and goes back to the theme of fighting for the future and not going out there to simply die for everyone else. So of course the big plan is put into effect. Godzilla is lured out into the ocean. The Ifakube Godzilla theme plays in addition to the main theme from King Kong vs. Godzilla. Godzilla is sunk to the bottom of the ocean, but he didn't die from the pressure. So they pull him up. He is looking like a creeped out zombie in a way but they can't pull him up quickly enough because Godzilla chews through the balloons that were trying to pull him up. So the two cruisers that everyone is using for this operation have to pull Godzilla out of the surface, but they can't because Godzilla is so heavy. Now, one thing I should mention beforehand is that Kid is not part of this operation. Captain and Doc tell him, you didn't serve in the war, so you need to stay and survive. And Kid is basically like, I want to help out. This is my country too. I want to help protect it. And as all seems lost, these two cruisers can't pull Godzilla to the surface. Kid basically brings in an escort of tugboats to come in, attach themselves to the cruiser, and help pull Godzilla to the surface. And I've heard people say that it's the big Avengers Endgame moment. And I guess you can look at it that way, but... I think a better comparison would be Dunkirk. Because if you know anything about the history of Dunkirk, not just the Nolan movie, but a bunch of civilian vessels come in to pretty much save the soldiers where the British government couldn't. And that's exactly what happens here in Godzilla Minus One. So Godzilla is lifted to the surface. He's not killed. It is more rageful than ever. And you really get that sense of fear that they lost. 
Godzilla is going to kill all of them right then and there and show no mercy. Then at the last minute, Koichi comes in, flies that plane into Godzilla's mouth, ejects, the plane blows up, and Godzilla is seemingly killed because his head blows up, he crumbles to pieces and sinks to the ocean. And now we come to the end of the movie that I originally had mixed feelings of, but over time I've kind of learned to accept it. We end up learning that Noriko survived Godzilla's attack on the city, and it's a moment where I thought, how did she survive that? But on the other hand, we never saw a body, so you know there's a slight chance that she could have survived. And the fact that this person that Koichi thought was dead is actually alive, it just gave me a very nice feeling. Like, yay, a happy ending. Or so we thought, because there's this weird mark on Noriko's neck that indicates some sort of radiation poisoning, but I'm not exactly sure. And then we cut to the ocean where pieces of Godzilla are starting to regenerate. The Ifakube theme plays once again, fade to black, and then the title card shows up. Godzilla minus one. Credits roll. My favorite movie of 2023. Like I said in my best of list, the second the credits started rolling, I knew that this was my favorite movie of the year, and there's a really good argument to be made that this is indeed the best Godzilla movie out there. I will say this, it certainly has the best characters of the entire franchise, because I still love the 1954 film. That one will always be my favorite of the franchise, but outside of Dr. Serizawa and Emiko Yamane, None of the other characters are as interesting or as fun to watch uh, as the characters in Minus One. Uh, every single character in this movie is important, is interesting, you're invested in their stories, and you care about them at the end of the day. So that's where Godzilla Minus One wins for me. Uh, I still stand by my statement that this is the second best film in the franchise. I absolutely adore it. I am so curious to see if they allow Yamazaki to make a sequel to this film because we didn't actually get a sequel to Shin Godzilla, so I'm wondering if the Reiwa era would just end up being like the Millennium era, except each of them is a full-fledged reboot, ignoring the 1954 film. I honestly hope not. I really hope that we get some sort of continuity in the Reiwa era, and having a Godzilla series that takes place in the past would be super fascinating. If Yamazaki does make a sequel to Godzilla Minus One, I am not holding my breath that it's going to be as good as Minus One because the bar is so high, I don't think anything can touch it. But then again, I said the same thing about Shin Godzilla, and look what happened. But I hope he gets to make a sequel. This is such a great movie at the end of the day, and right now, it's my favorite movie of the entire decade. We are five years away from the end of the decade, but really, it's gonna be a difficult challenge for any movie to compete with Godzilla Minus One. So, I wouldn't be shocked if this stays my favorite movie of the decade, but you never know. And there you go, that's my spoiler review for Godzilla Minus One. Now I will be doing a live watch party when this movie comes out on Blu-ray, hopefully. And I will be doing a trailer talk for the next Godzilla movie, Godzilla X Kong The New Empire, because the trailer came out the week Godzilla Minus One was released in the United States, but I was heading to Texas for a family emergency, so I just couldn't get around to talking about it. And you know the holidays, so... There was a lot going on, but I will be getting this video out probably in the next weekend, so keep your eyes open for that. But until then, I want to hear your thoughts on Godzilla Minus One again. Whatever they are, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell button to get notifications. If you want to find me elsewhere on YouTube, you can go check out my vlog channel, Alexander Robinson Travel Channel, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Letterboxd, Threads. I'll see you guys in the next video, but until then, have a good day and take care of yourselves.